Well, hello, church friends. Man, we are so thankful that you have joined us for another online service. Uh, man, we just love spending time with you in God's Word. Well, a couple of things. Uh, first one, my name is Chris. And I'm one of the pastors here at ABF, and I have a couple announcements for you. The first one is we love praying for you throughout the week. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, it doesn't matter if you live in Hawaii, if you attend Agora Bible, we want to pray for you. So you could send your prayer request to 97,000, 97,000, and we will receive those prayer requests and we will pray for you through the week. The second thing is we have a lot going on here at the church every single week across our adult ministries, high school, junior high, children's, something for every single person. And we want to make sure that you have access to that information. You can find information for all of our events and happenings at our website at agorabible.com. Org. Or you can find the information on our, on our Church Center app. Well, lastly, we are just so uh, thankful for your ongoing generosity. Uh, we can't do what we do without your faithfulness and giving. And uh, we would be so appreciated if you uh, were able to make a donation, uh, something you can prayerfully consider doing. Uh, you can do that on our website under the Give tab or on our Church Center app. Well, before we dive into God's word, uh, we just want to provide an opportunity and take communion together. And uh, man, it, this is uh, this communion is for those who uh, put their uh, faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we want to give you a moment to go ahead and pause this real quick and go get a cracker, or a piece of bread, and some juice, and then uh, we'll continue. This bread represents the body of Jesus, the body that was broken on the cross for you and me. Partake and remember him. This cup of juice Nothing special about it, just a cup of juice, but it represents the blood that was spilled for you and me. Take in remembrance of him. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to dive into God's word, to dive into your word, Lord. And we also thank you for an opportunity to partake in communion. Lord, we thank you so much for your body that was broken on a cross and the blood that was spilled to forgive our sins, Lord. And we thank you for the price that you pay, Lord. May you now go before us, Lord. May the Holy Spirit move us, Lord, and nudge us, Lord, to hear exactly what you have us, uh, have planned for us to hear, Lord, as uh, we go through your word together. And we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, thanks so much, Chris. That was wonderful having communion together. Wish you could all be with us. Thank you, ABF Online, for joining us again today. We are still in our series called Better Together in 1 Corinthians 15. And I, I've entitled this message, The Gospel Recipe. Now, it's kind of ironic since we're in the middle of a fasting program here at ABF in the month of March, and I'm going to talk about food. I want to ask you a question. Do you have a favorite family recipe? If so, what is, it? what is it? Is it a secret recipe? Does it get passed down from generation to generation? Uh, for some people, uh, there are special ingredients like Kentucky Fried Chicken. You, know, you don't know what the special ingredients are. Our family recipes include... Uh, my grandma's fried chicken, my wife's enchiladas, uh, and then my mom's famous orange cake. Yes, orange cake. But I'll tell you what, we have no family recipe secrets. We just share those freely with anybody who would ask. And it's interesting that as we look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to look at the recipe of the gospel. What are the ingredients of the gospel? And just like our family recipes, uh, it's freely shared here in the scripture. So we're going to look at that together. We're so glad you're with us. So let's jump in, get 1 Corinthians 15 open. And if you have not downloaded the notes, go ahead and do that. 
And we'll look at point number one, the precious integrity of the gospel, verses one and two. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, and I want you to underline three words or highlight them on your phones, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Let me just su- su- suggest that, uh, I can say that three times fast, let me suggest that there is a simplicity of, of the gospel. It, it isn't rocket science. I don't know how many of you have just seen the Jesus Revolution uh, story of Calvary Chapel and Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie, but I was reminded again of the simplicity of the gospel in the 60s with hippies coming to Christ and turning their lives to Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, however, in this context, as you know, the whole book, Pastor Scott's been dealing with so many different questions and issues and problems, and if he wasn't, Josh was. And so, ironically, I was supposed to preach last week, but I was on a cruise in the Caribbean with our grandkids and our kids, and I missed that bullet. And so I get to preach on 1 Corinthians 15, which is really the only doctrinal portion of this book. And we're going to look at the importance of the resurrection, but it may be not exactly what you think. The problem here was not that the Corinthians disbelieved that Christ's uh, resurrection was in doubt. The problem was they weren't sure about what happened to them when they died, would they ultimately be resurrected as well? So he's not trying to necessarily, although he does, convince them that Christ rose from the dead, but that they one day too also would be raised with him to eternal life. So what about this simplicity of the gospel? Let me just give you the ABCs from this text in uh, three words. First of all, our conversion, it says we accept it. And so we see that their denial of the resurrection might have been a big problem and would be a big problem because maybe they didn't quite believe the whole Jesus story anyway. Remember, Corinthians had a ton of issues and things they had to deal with. Now, my question to you is, When did you give your life to Christ? I know when I did, and I think I may have shared this story before, but it was January 8th, 1963 at West Covina Christian School when I gave my life to Christ. You said, I'm doing the math, John. I know you're 67 years old. If we do the math, you're you're like young. Yeah, I was like seven years old or so. I was in first grade. Mrs. Mayer, our our first grade teacher, Uh, did her version of sinners in the hands of an angry God, and she talked about hell to 24 first graders. This is not probably the way we would do it today. But I'm telling you, when she said, would any of you like to go to heaven instead of hell and be with Jesus for all of eternity? 24 hands go up. Yes, count me in. And uh, it was a sweet moment. And uh, she actually took me to the church, uh, to the school office later, along with all the other kids, and eventually she typed up a, on an IBM Selectric typewriter. For those of you under 40, you can Google that and find out what that is. But the bottom line, she typed that little statement for me on a card saying, I, John Lee Irwin, accepted Jesus as my Savior. Now I know that I love him and he loves me. And my little chicken scratching, I signed it. And so I accept that was my conversion back in 1963. And then he says, but your conviction... We base our life on it, not just praying that prayer, in which you stand. And it was many years later as an eighth grader going into high school where I kind of recommitted my life to Christ and I stood firm on the foundation that I had assurance that I was a Christian. Some of you have had those crises of faith. I had it when I was 13, 14 years old. Some of you have had it when you're 23, 33, 43, or maybe you're even in crisis now. And so it's not so much a statement about losing your salvation, but making sure that you had properly placed your faith in Christ originally. Look at this verse on the screen, Romans 1, 4, and it was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the third phase is our capacity. We continue in it. It says, by which you are being saved, this continuous progressive thing, Now, we are talking about your sanctification process. Once you trust Christ, then the rest of your life until you die is that process of becoming more like him. We call it the sanctification process. And so that idea of holding fast, our holding on to him is probably evidence that he is holding on 
to us. And those who would forsake the church or Christ, maybe they never really belonged to him to begin with. You can check that out in 1 John 2, 19. They were not of us. And so that brings us to this idea that if you are truly saved, you will per, uh, per persevere till the end, the perseverance of the saints. All right, point number two on your outline is the public ingredients of the gospel. What does the world see? These few verses describe the events, the phases of what happened to Christ, and this is what everybody saw publicly. What are those ingredients of the gospel recipe? Well, first of all, he had to die. That's not surprising. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Two things are important. He died for what? For your sins, for my sins, for everybody's sins. And then secondly, according to the Scriptures, in other words, this was prophesied. Jesus died. It was recorded in Jewish history uh, in books, not just the Bible. He's a real person. It's documented and uh, both inside and out of the Bible. Now, the bottom line is there was a, a theory going around later on, uh, many years later, uh, when modern scholarship want to say, well, Jesus didn't really die. He just, it's called the swoon theory. He just kind of was revived by that cold tomb after losing four quarts of blood and all the viciousness of the crucifixion. Pretty much that's been debunked. And so we know that his death was confirmed at the cross before he was even taken and buried in a rich man's tomb, according to John 19. But it does remind me of this idea of the swoon theory about uh, a pastor in, in northern Minnesota. As you know, I pastored there for 14 years. And he would travel to small rural areas where they didn't really have a church, and he would perform funerals. And he would often drive with the undertaker, the mortician from the funeral home, in the hearse with him. He drive, the guy would drive, he'd be in the, in the, in the uh, front seat with him, and they'd drive, they, he'd perform the service, and then they'd drive home. Well, uh, as they were driving back, it was a long way to the Twin Cities, and so he was kind of falling asleep against the, you know, the window, and the mortician said, well, pastor, why don't you just hop in the back? You know, again, the body has been disposed of, they've done the funeral service, so he lays down in the back of the hearse. Kind of creepy, uh, I'm not sure I would be doing that, but he lays down, he stretches out, and you know for sure what happens. He falls asleep. I mean, he is out, and he's sound asleep. Well, they had to stop to get gas. Uh, the mortician doesn't want to wake up the pastor, so he stops and gets gas, and he's filling up, and while he's laying down, and this was, by the way, when they had full-service gas stations, and so the attendant comes out, he's, he's filling up, he looks in the window, and he sees what he thinks is a dead body, and he's going, that's kind of creepy, like, can, oh, this is weird. But he is flabbergasted, can hardly believe it, when the pastor wakes up, shakes his head, and waves at him and about gave a heart attack to the guy filling the hearse with gas. And so clearly, uh, the pastor had been revived. And so that might be a swoon theory, but Jesus completely was dead, and he did die. Well, it says then that he was buried and raised Look at verse 4, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We'll look more about this resurrection in a moment, but clearly we know he's embalmed, he was wrapped, placed in a rich man's tomb, it fulfilled the scriptures. You can check that out in Matthew 27. And the resurrection that separates Jesus from every other world leader, name them, Buddha, Muhammad, Gandhi, Abraham, none of them ever claimed to be uh, found alive after their death or rise from the grave. In fact, Muhammad, we know exactly when he died on June 8th, 632 AD at the age of 61, and his tomb is visited by thousands every year. Now, Jesus, Peter, Paul, all quoted, referred to Old Testament passages like Genesis 22, Psalm uh, 16, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, on and on and on. Now, Without getting into the whole apologetics of the resurrection, I am reminded of a story from nature about how a possum never goes into a hole if it only sees one set of tracks going in, because that means there's somebody still in there. The wonderful news of the gospel is that we saw two sets of tracks, quote unquote, uh, hypothetically speaking, as the tracks end, Jesus was buried, and then 
the tracks coming out where he was risen from the dead. There was a resurrection. And that is the message not only for today, but for all of us to cling to. Then it says, point three, that he appeared, verses five through seven. And we see the pro- begin to see these proofs of the resurrection by all the individuals and groups that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. This is really important because there's a lot of people that saw him alive that if we went into a court of law, we'd say, oh, yeah, that's, that's evidence. Here's the first one. And then he appeared to Cephas, which we know is Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Let's go through the list and see why that's important. And I believe there's an order of importance as you go through this list. First one he goes to is Cephas, a.k.a. Peter. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because Peter is so remorseful for what he had just done. As you know, he denied Christ three times after valiantly declaring that he would stand for Christ no matter what. Remember at the Last Supper? And so he wants to lovingly bless him and comfort him. Uh, not some kind of legalistic confrontation. Now, some would say, no, it's because he's the leader of the early church, kind of the leader of the big three, Peter, James, and John. Uh, the Corinthian church did revere Peter, and that's true to, for sure. But the bottom line is he is quick to talk to Peter. And all we know is that sometime after his appearances to Mary, but before he does this walk on the road to Emmaus. So we don't exactly when it happened, but I believe it was a private moment for this singular reason. Peter was lost. Peter was downcast. Peter is beside himself. He had given up on the man who had invested three plus years in his life, and he is, he is downtrodden. And Jesus, and we have, a, we have another scene of this, but the prelude is here, but later on the beach when they're doing the fish fry, Uh, they do the famous, Peter, do you love me three times, kind of make up for the three times he denied him. And that reminds me of how we treat people. So many times there are people who disappoint us in life and we want to come back at them and, and want to kind of confront them. But I'll tell you more importantly, what's going on with your family? When someone has fallen, like your kid or your prodigal who's far from God, and then he comes back. Do you lovingly embrace them or do you kind of legalistically confront them? We have a great example of that, as you know, in the story of the prodigal son. And so that's why I think he went to Peter first, to model the fact that God's resurrection is a model of grace, forgiveness, and hope. And then he appeared to the 12. Those of you who were thinking say, uh-uh, there was only 11. Judas had taken his own life. We know later on that Matthias is the kind of replacement uh, apostle later on. And so he appears to them. And then he appears to 500 people. And this proves that there wasn't some kind of mass hysteria. You can't invent these kind of things. And because Paul is only writing about 23 years later, very likely uh, we think that most of those people are probably still alive and they can testify to what he's written about and what they actually saw. And then there's James. Now, who, what James? There's a several James. James, the uh, part of the big three. James, the brother of John, th- sons of thunder. James, the son of Alphaeus. No, no, no. I think this is James who wrote the book of James, who is what? He's the half-brother of Jesus. And even though we're not specifically about that, we know that he ultimately becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church, and you see that in Acts 15. Why is that significant? Because when Jesus was growing up, his family didn't quite buy what he was selling, did they? In fact, they didn't understand him, and they even were actively hostile to him at one time. Uh, and uh, we find that in Mark 3:21. And then they start to restrain him and thought he was a madman in John 7, 5. And even his own brothers didn't believe that he was the Son of God. Now, and just think about this for a moment. If you are the younger brother to Jesus Christ, what in the world was your childhood like? How would it be like to be in the family where the older brother literally never did anything wrong? He, he was always right, 
You are always the one left holding the bag. You're the one who gets blamed for everything. And I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't condescending and lording it over them. But the bottom line is, it had to be tough being in the family with the Son of God, right? So what must it have been like to be in the family where you are the younger brother, stepbrother, half-brother to the Son of God? It's a rough deal. And yet so often, that's exactly what we're facing uh, in our own families, aren't we? That's exactly what happens because some of you maybe took a long time to come to faith in Christ, right? And now you have, but not everybody in your family believes that your conversion or your change of life or your experience is real. Because some of you have come through horrific things. You were an alcoholic. Uh, You've been through a divorce. Uh, You've been arrested. Uh, you've not been able to keep a job, you might have been uh, dealing with drugs. And even if you were just a good moral person, not everybody buys in the fact that Christ changed your life and that you, that you really are genuinely different. And so I think it's great that Jesus appears to his half-brother James. And then he does appear to all the apostles. And by that, it's not just the 12, we're talking about the greater um, group of apostles, the, the disciples, the followers that followed him. And over a period of 50 days, it says in Acts 1-3, between his resurrection and, and his ascension, he appeared to everybody. And we see that, uh, though we don't know what all those occasions were. And in that, we see our alternate juror, juror uh, alternate disciple Matthias was probably included in that. Well, let's look at the third point, the personal impact of the gospel the first points were about the world, but this is on Paul himself in verses 8 to 11. And there are two things about Paul we're going to look at, guilt and grace. And let's look at it. Verses 8 and 9, we see the guilt, we see the unworthiness of Paul. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to be, also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles and worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That word untimely born is the word ectroma. It literally means to refers to an abortion, miscarriage, or premature birth. Paul kind of con- conceived of himself as kind of a freak because, you know, he had been persecuting the church. Uh, in comparison, the other apostles like Apollos and Peter, uh, his name even Paulus means little one. Um, the bottom line is Paul really, really needed Christ. And his appearance uh, to him is is uh, post-resurrection and post-ascension, so it makes his testimony even more unique. Now, this is the fact. That's the focus, but the fact was this. Paul persecuted Christians before conversion. I'm pretty sure none of you in coming to Christ ever killed another Christian. Maybe you've done some pretty crazy, unbelievable stuff, and God's forgiven you for all that, But Paul felt so unworthy, and and rightfully so on one level, on a human level, because while the other apostles uh, were building up the church, he had been tearing it down, literally. And he he persecuted the church. And so I'm sure he wrestled with his own self-image, his own comparisons to some of these other great men of faith. And so that'll lead us to something here in a moment. But his feelings were that I think he felt a lot of guilt. He felt unworthy. He felt less than. Satan does that with us today, friends. He makes us feel less than. Many of you feel unworthy. And you beat yourselves up for something that Christ forgave a long time ago on the cross. Uh, We sometimes feel inferior to better Christians. And we've got this grocery list of things that how we should be- believe or behave and how we should perform. And, and so often it, it's, it's a much higher standard than God lays on us. And in fact, we really wonder whether we measure up and we secretly wonder how could Christ ever really forgive us? So you're in good company with Paul who, who had some of those same feelings. But the good news is look at the grace, the unmerited favor of God to him we see in verses 10 and 11. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. 
Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. By the way, grace is never wasted and grace does the work. We don't have to. I love John Newton's quote. He says this, I am not what I hope to be, but I am not what I once was. And so now, point four, we see the powerful importance of the gospel, verses 12 to 19. This will be the end of our passage. And we're going to start with the significance of the resurrection, and then we'll deal with a so what. So this is a a bit apologetic, but there are six consequences. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ doesn't happen, it is a domino effect. It is a cascading effect of consequences that it does not end well for us if, if this isn't true. So let's look at them, see what it says. The first one is this. There is a theological problem, verses 12 and 13. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, right? We have a problem, Houston. If Christ isn't risen from the dead, we don't have Christianity as we know it today because that makes it like any other world religion. All those other dead folks like Buddha and Muhammad, etc., are in the grave. He's the only one who conquered death. And so I think the Corinthian church is having some confusion about this resurrection in general and because they are influenced so heavily by the Greeks and the, their lack of believing in the bodily resurrection. Even the Sadducees and the Pharisees had differences on that. The Sadducees didn't really believe in a resurrection. But it does remind me of this Christ being raised from dead, a, a funny story. Um, some of you know that uh, people go to Israel all the time, and the story goes that there was a man, and let's just say that he had a wife that was kind of naggy, or if you want to flip the script, you have a, a wonderful wife with a grumpy old man. So you can take it either way, but we'll go, uh, let's just, let's flip the script here. It, it's a, uh, so you can tell already, this might be a slightly apocryphal story, huh? Uh, so let's go with the, the happy wife and the grumpy old man. And while they're there, the man passes away. And the undertaker says to her, ma'am, hey, um, you, you could uh, just, you know, bury him here for $150, and, uh, or, or you can have his body shipped back to the United States, and, but that'll cost you like $10,000. And so she thinks about it for a moment, and she says, well, I think I better uh, ship him back, you know, to the United States. You know, the mortician uh, says to himself uh, and to her, lady, why in the world would you do that? You're going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars to have him shipped back. Why not just do it here? Well, the, 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 the thoughtful lady said this. She said, well, a long, long time ago, a man died here and was buried here. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And I just can't take that chance with him. Well, We know that Christ did rise from the dead. So we have a theological problem if he doesn't. Well, what's the practical problem in verse 14? Look at this one. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. So he's saying, let's assume for the moment that he didn't rise from the dead, then this is also going to be true. You've got a practical problem because your faith is worthless. It, it, it makes no sense. What, why are you doing this if he didn't rise from the dead? It, your preaching is based on a false premise. And so life is empty, hopeless, etc. Then you have an integrity problem. Look at verses 15 and 16. We're even found to be misrep- misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, <clears throat> whom he did not raise, if it is true <clears throat> that the dead wa- was not raised, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. In other words, we're liars. We're fooling ourselves. This is an integrity problem. By the way, I think a lot of us as believers, uh, we've got to be clear on our facts, not jump on some popular internet myth and what we say about what was found and who did what. Uh, make sure our integrity is intact, especially as you're sharing the gospel. Then we have a personal problem. Look at verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. In other words, 
There's no forgiveness of sins. Your faith means nothing. You're stuck with your sin. There's no future hope, and there's certainly not forgiveness. This is not good, friends. Let's look at the next step. Then you have a perishing, a.k.a. eternal problem, verses, verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep, and we know that means physical death, not just sleeping, fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, all those Old Testament saints and believers who have preceded us in death, they're forever dead, never to rise again. That's a problem. And then we have a pity problem. Look at verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And if this is true, if life is just temporal, we have no future hope, there's no life after death, there's no resurrection, we've lived our entire lives for a lie. And the world then sees us as misinformed religious zealots who centered their whole lives on a religion that was untrustworthy and ultimately deeply flawed. Well, friends, that's why Christianity rises or falls on the evidence for the resurrection. This is just a small piece of scripture that we've looked at today. And so let's ask ourselves, what's the so what of the resurrection? Christianity, I'll say it again, rises and falls on the historicity of the resurrection. And that's why it's very interesting. Most of the, the new age atheists don't really want to debate the resurrection, uh, whether it's Dawkins, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, when you, uh, there's a lot of good work done by uh, F. Craig Lane, uh, Sean McDowell, his dad, Josh McDowell, uh, Craig Hazen, all these names, read these guys because they have a lot of great information on the historicity and the veracity of the resurrection. So we come down to what is known as Pascal's wager, friends. Pascal, a French mathematician, said this. He said, if Christianity is true, as a believer, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. He also post, uh, had this postulate that he said, but if you're a non-believer and Christianity is true, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain. And so, friend, your life Today, and many of you who are watching this online, maybe you've stumbled onto this, this sermon, and maybe you've never given your life to Christ. And I would just want to encourage you today, right now, in front of that, that TV, to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I am in need of a Savior. I trust in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. I know that you died on the cross, was buried, and that you rose on the third day and resurrected to new life. And I need you and I place my trust and faith in that fact. And if you prayed that prayer just now, then you are going from death to life. The, switch, the light switch goes from off to on. And quite frankly, you are now a part of the family of God. And so the great news of 1 Corinthians 15 is that we have a hope that hope is secure. The recipe of the gospel, the ingredients are right there for all of us to see. Uh, died, buried, raised again, appeared to over 500 people, and then all those problems, we can check them off. No, we don't have those problems. We don't have a theological problem, a practical problem, an integrity problem, a personal problem, a perishing problem, or a pity problem because the resurrection is real. Amen? Would you just bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight, for today, for whenever someone is watching this sermon, that there is hope that the resurrection is true, that the gospel recipe, that the resurrection is the central piece of that, lives true, rings true, and is true. And so, again, Lord, I thank you for what you did on the cross for me all those many years ago, over 2,000 years ago, and that I've been able to place my trust and faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.